Oh, before you start, as MC, let me just tell you a little bit about how this goes. So hopefully you'll talk for about 45 minutes. And, um, and then um, I have invited two of our guests to offer commentary if they wish to do so. If they do, wonderful. If not, I'll open it to questions from the audience, OK? All right, good. Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction and for the invitation to be here. And thank all of you for, for coming here this afternoon. I'm going to be speaking about the nature of consciousness, a neurophenomenological approach. And I want to begin with an image that I imagine many of you are familiar with. This is a lithograph by M.C. Escher that's um, from 1956. And it depicts a man in a gallery viewing a print of a seaport. And the gallery in which he's standing is one of the buildings in the seaport. The picture exemplifies what Douglas Hofstetter calls a strange loop. The gallery is in the town. The town is in the picture. The picture, as a picture, is mentally in the person viewing it. That is sort of as a content of his perceptual experience. But the person is in the picture. And of course, we are the ones viewing this strange loop. So it's in us, in a sense. And at the center of this strange loop is a circular void or emptiness, where Escher has signed his name. Now, in Buddhism, this absence at the heart of presence is called shunyata, emptiness. And it's one of our themes of the meeting. And in one of the very early Indian Buddhist philosophical texts by the Indian philosopher Nagarjuna, the fundamental stanzas of the Middle Way, Nagarjuna says, Whatever is dependently co-arisen, that is explained to be emptiness. So we have these linked concepts of emptiness and dependent origination or dependent arising. Now, I think in contemporary Western philosophy, there are a number of ways in which this idea is echoed in thinking about the relationship between the mind and the world, the idea of dependent origination. So for example, Hilary Putnam, in one of his classic books from the early 1980s, says the mind and the world jointly make up the mind and the world. Some decades earlier, the French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty said in his Phenomenology of Perception, the world is inseparable from the subject, but from a subject who is nothing but a project of the world. And the subject is inseparable from the world, but from a world that it itself projects. Now, I want to take two guiding thoughts for what I'm going to tell you today from these strange loops. One, I'm going to call the primacy of consciousness. And what I mean by that is that there's no way to step outside of consciousness in the form of lived experience. Everything we investigate, including consciousness and its place in nature, is always disclosed from within the horizon of lived experience. And this includes when we're doing science. The second thought is what I'm going to call the primacy of embodiment. And that is that lived experience never shows up apart from our embodied being in the world. So with those introductory thoughts, here is the outline of what I want to present to you today. I want to say some more things in detail with a bit more philosophical precision, I hope, about what I mean by the primacy of consciousness. And then I'm going to say some things about the problem with physicalism. Physicalism is the philosophical or metaphysical thesis that everything that exists, or at least everything concrete that exists, leaving out math and logic and things of that sort, everything that concretely exists is physical, including the mental. So I'm going to say some critical things about that. And then the question will arise, well, does that mean that panpsychism, that everything is fundamentally mental, is that how we should think about things? And I'm going to say panpsychism does have an insight, but no, it's not quite, what we, it's not quite right. And that's going to take us into the primacy of embodiment, my second guiding thought. And then I'm going to end with some remarks about neurophenomenology. OK. so. To talk about the primacy of consciousness, let's go back again to this quotation from Merleau-Ponty. 
The world is inseparable from the subject, but from a subject who is nothing but a project of the world. And, and this is the one I want to emphasize for our purposes at the moment, the subject is inseparable from the world, but from a world that it itself projects. So the primacy of consciousness here can be thought of as the idea that in knowing the world, we cannot step outside the horizon of our lived experience. So let, let's think about this metaphor of the horizon for a moment. The line of the horizon is a limit beyond which we can't go. But it's an apparent line and a structure of our perception. And it travels with us. So on the one hand, we could say the horizon is indeed real. It's the farthest point the eye can see before the Earth's surface curves away beneath our view. But we could also say, in the philosophical sense of the term ideal, that it's ideal. That is to say, it's a structure of our perception. It's not something that exists independent of perception. That doesn't mean that it's in my head. It's a relation between me and the world. Now, in phenomenological philosophy, particularly the writings of Husserl, we have what could be called a horizontal conception of consciousness. Husserl uses the term horizon throughout his writings in, in a number of different ways. But very generally, we could say that the horizontal conception of consciousness is the conception of consciousness as the horizon from within which the world is present and disclosed to us. Wherever we find ourselves, whether we're observing something in a scientific context or whether we're out on a boat sailing, we always find whatever we find from within the horizon of our lived experience. Now, if you're a philosopher or you're familiar with contemporary philosophy, the horizon is, let's call it, a phenomenal structure of consciousness. It's not a particular phenomenal property like the sourness of lemon or the redness of the sunset. It's not, in other words, a, a qualia, that is qualia in the way that philosophers use the term qualia to refer to the particular qualitative properties of a given perceptual or sensory experience. Indeed, qualia and phenomenal contents, that is whatever you're experiencing, whether you're awake and perceiving, whether you're mind wandering and caught up in some thought, whether you're falling asleep and seeing images play before your eyes, whether you're in a dream, whether you're having a lucid dream, whatever it is that you're experiencing, those contents appear from within the horizon of consciousness. So this horizontal notion is not a content, any particular content, it's a structure. It's a structure of awareness, but it's a phenomenal structure. Now, here we come upon the first sense in which I think we can highlight the primacy of consciousness. And I'm going to call this the existential primacy. Because consciousness in this horizontal sense is not something we have. It's rather something we are. Or we could say it's something that we live. So it has existential primacy. And phenomenologists talk about this in different ways. Heidegger talks about our being in the world. Merleau-Ponty talks about the lived body. Husserl talks about the life world, the horizontal um, consciousness of the life world. There are different terms, and some may be better than others, but they're all about this existential primacy of lived experience. So if we think about this, though, horizontal consciousness, in a way, is nothing in itself. Right? I said it's a structure, not a particular content. It's whatever the contents that we are experiencing are structured in the way that they are. So in Buddhist terms, that is to say it's empty, shunya, of own beings, fabhava. That is, it doesn't have an intrinsic reality of its own. Rather, it's nothing other than the manifestation of the world. It's, we could say, the disclosure or manifestation of our life world, our concrete lived reality and lived experience. Now, I just used the term life world, which is another phenomenological term of art, Lebensweltung. So let's think about this for a minute in relationship to the concept of the universe. If we're thinking as natural scientists, we might say the universe, that is the totality of nature, contains the life world, contains our life world. And indeed, that makes perfect sense. And there's, there's nothing objectionable about that statement. But for a philosopher, we also want to be able to say that the life world, and now we could elaborate this, 
as the space of meaning within, within which anything is intelligible, anything is thinkable, anything is observable, that that contains the universe. Because the universe is always disclosed to us from within the life world. After all, our scientific endeavor of opening up new realms of observation and new ways of intervening within them is always within our life world. So a philosopher wants to say, yes, of course the natural science perspective on the universe has its validity. But the philosophical position, the position that reverses the primacy or the order of priority also has its validity. And it's important not to lose sight of that. Now this brings us to another sense of the primacy of consciousness, which is its epistemological primacy. And in a way, I've already said this, but I'm going to elaborate it in a bit more detail. As we live and as we investigate our world, we open up new vistas with new horizons. We do this in all sorts of ways. I'm emphasizing science, but of course art does that in, in, in its own way. The way that we do this in science is powerful, unique, distinctive, and it's by producing objective knowledge. Objective doesn't mean independent of us. It means tested and it means consensual. You could say it means intersubjective. So let me spell that out. Lived experience is a point of departure and a point of return for the production of objective knowledge. Because the way science proceeds and the way it's evolved historically, if we look from, say, Galileo up to today, is that we set aside aspects of our concrete experience on which we can't agree. The particularities of my sensations versus yours, or how I taste things, or aesthetically evaluate them versus the way that you do our values, our emotions, we try to, as much as possible, bracket those. There are questions about how much we can do this, but that's the effort. And then what we do is we extract abstract and idealized invariance, structural, relational properties that are structural residues of our experience. And then we, we can treat these as objects of consensus. We can test them, and these are things like general propositions and logic, or mathematical um, models, or formulae. And then we implement these abstractions by way of technology. And when we do that, we can intervene, we can manipulate, we can measure, we, we can control phenomena, always in a contextually situated and limited way. But all of that, of course, is registered in our experience. You have to observe something. You have to record a measurement. That requires experience. So an important implication of this is that claiming that consciousness, in this now sense of lived experience, can be reductively explained. I'm emphasizing the word reductively now. Can be reductively explained by one of its structural residues. For example, in the context of neuroscience today, where we're thinking about consciousness, something like Tononi's integrated information theory or the global workspace theory of consciousness and, and, and um, its, its neuronal architecture. To claim that we can reductively explain consciousness in terms of that, rather than establishing a relationship between the two, is to turn the whole epistemological procedure upside down. And this is indeed Husserl's point in his work of 1938, The Crisis of European Sciences and Transcendental Phenomenology. He argues that it's in principle absurd to think that we can explain subjective experience by reducing it to certain objects of science, since these objects are abstract relational structures extracted from the life world of lived experience. So it's to invert the order, the epistemological order. He's not arguing against science. He's arguing that we need to understand how it's situated in relationship to our lived experience. And Husserl thought that the deep you could say existential or spiritual crisis of our scientific culture is that we constantly forget that lived experience is the source of science and its ground of validity. This is what Adam and Marcelo and I have been talking about in terms of a kind of blind spot in our scientific culture. Now, finally, this brings us to a more um, difficult but in some ways more precise philosophical sense of the primacy of consciousness which following Kant, we could call the transcendental primacy of consciousness. And transcendental here is being used in Kant's sense, not in, say, the sense of transcendental meditation. That dates me, I suppose. 
So the idea here is that consciousness is the condition of possibility for scientific knowledge. So, so let me read to you something that Kant says when he's defining the word transcendental. He says, I entitle transcendental all knowledge which is occupied, not so much with objects, with, with what, as with the mode of our knowledge of objects, with how, how we know, not what we know, insofar as this mode of knowledge is to be possible a priori. So Kant says, we have knowledge. We take that for granted. And now the question is, how is it that we know what we know? How, what are the conditions of possibility for our having the kind of experience and knowledge that we have? And that kind of investigation is a transcendental investigation in his sense. And the point here is that consciousness then is not another object of knowledge, or we could say not just another object of knowledge. It's that by which any object is knowable. And when we think about it this way, that is to say transcendentally in Kant's sense, and also Husserl's, consciousness is irreducible to the domain of objects. It doesn't make sense to treat it as an object because it's the condition of possibility for objects being manifest to us in all the ways that they are in the first place. So to summarize, consciousness has primacy existentially, in the sense of it's what we live, our concrete lived experience. Epistemologically, it's the point of departure and the point of return for science. And transcendentally, it's, this is a, a sort of English rendering of a German term, as you can probably tell, it's the ungo behindable condition of possibility for knowledge. Okay, so now, note, it does not follow from this argument. That is to say, this argument does not logically entail that consciousness has ontological primacy in the panpsychist sense. That is, it doesn't follow that the property of being conscious is an extra ingredient, this is Dave Chalmers' term, in nature at the fundamental microphysical level. And I'm gonna come back to this point later when I talk about panpsychism. I just want to flag that nothing I've said so far logically entails that way of thinking about consciousness, that it's everywhere in nature microphysically. I think that way of thinking gets something right, but I also think it gets something wrong. So I'm gonna come back to that. That's a sort of teaser, I hope. Okay, so I've now told you what I mean when I'm using this expression, the primacy of consciousness. So now I want to say some things about the problem with physicalism. In a nutshell, Physicalism, I think, is a useless thesis. Physicalism is the thesis that everything is physical or everything concrete is physical. The immediate problem is that physical is not well-defined. What does it mean? Attempts to define it make physicalism either false, empty, not in the Buddhist sense, or non-naturalist. So let me spell that out. This is not a thought by any means original to me. It goes back to the philosopher Carl Hempel, and it's known as Hempel's Dilemma. And the dilemma is if we define physical as what contemporary physics tells us is physical, then physicalism is very likely to be false. If we define, because physics obviously is a work in progress and any inductive argument from the history of science is gonna lead us to think that physics is, undergo, is going to undergo radical revision. On the other hand, if we define physical by what, by what the ideal completed physics, if it even makes sense to think of that, but let's suppose that it does, if we define it in terms of the meaning of physical for the ideal completed physics, then physicalism is empty because we don't know what that physics will be. We have no, we have no kind of tangible sense of exactly what that means. Now, at this point, some philosophers, there's a, there's a kind of trend in philosophy today to try to define physicalism for the scientists and for other philosophers. So some philosophers will say, look, we shouldn't hand over all authority to the physicists or to physics to determine what's physical because no matter how far the bounds of the physical stretch, it's a conceptual truth or you could say it's an a priori truth that the bounds of the physical can't include fundamental mentality or strong emergence, the idea of radically new emergent configurational forces. Now, I don't think this works. This gambit basically shows that physicalists, and I'm talking about physicalist philosophers now, are caught between, on the one hand, wanting to be naturalists, because the whole point of the term physicalism as opposed to materialism was to signal the, the preeminence of physics, phys physical science. So on the one hand, physicalist philosophers want to be naturalists, as indeed they should, who defer to science, but they want to be metaphysicians too, because after all, they're philosophers. 
And that leads them to place a priori restrictions, or to try to place a priori restrictions on what can count as physical. Now, I think that a number of years ago, Chomsky, in one of his books, basically showed that this is really wrongheaded. He points out that trying to restrict a priori what counts as physical is like a 17th century materialist responding to Newton, trying to restrict a priori what counts as matter. And we know from the history of science that science simply supersedes that kind of metaphysics or that way of doing metaphysics. OK, so the upshot then is that understanding the mind and its place in nature is, of course, a genuine and extremely important scientific and philosophical enterprise, but physicalism is useless to it. All right, so now maybe panpsychism. Is that what follows here? Well, I don't think so. Panpsychism is undergoing a resurgence. You can see that in the book there, which just came out uh, last year, a collection of articles by a whole bunch of philosophers, very interesting articles on panpsychism, exploring it as an option in philosophy of mind today, or metaphysics. So it's the view that everything is mental or phenomenal or experiential, to put it in the most general way. And it's based on this recognition that you can't get consciousness, qualia, the qualitative characteristics of experience or subjectivity, out of the abstract relational properties of natural science. Equations relating magnitudes, for example, or mathematical functions, you don't get the consciousness out of that. You get, a, you get an abstract relational structure. So that's a recognition. That's an insight. But panpsychist response is to postulate that consciousness is everywhere as an intrinsic property of physical nature. Now, I want to take you through the, the argument that, that leads to this thought, or what I think is the best argument, or the most interesting, I suppose, forceful. And this is an argument that we see in some ways in Whitehead, although I wouldn't quite call Whitehead a panpsychist in this sense, but in some ways we see elements of it in Whitehead. We see it in the physicist Sir Arthur Eddington. We see it in Bertrand Russell. And we see it today in Galen Strawson, all of whom are extremely interesting writers. And the argument goes like this. Physics reveals to us only the relational properties of physical phenomena. It gives us models with magnitudes and equations relating them. Relational properties need intrinsic properties, are determined by intrinsic properties. So this argument says, certain configurations of physical phenomena generate or constitute phenomenal states, the brain and the body. So the intrinsic properties of physical phenomena must encompass this power. Our own inner awareness reveals that phenomenality the taste of something, the quality of, of something visually, is an intrinsic property of our experience. Indeed, it's the only intrinsic property that we know of, because science doesn't give us intrinsic properties. So phenomenality must then be an intrinsic property of physical phenomena, or at least of certain organized physical systems. That's, this, that's the argument as we see it deployed today. Now, there are two problematic assumptions in this argument. One is that relational properties are determined by intrinsic properties. It seems to me entirely possible that, um, and indeed it would be a Buddhist idea, that there are no intrinsic properties, svabhava, own being. There's just dependent arising in relationality, all the way down, all the way up, and all the way out. So this premise is contestable. And indeed, there are some very interesting technical arguments around this in Indian philosophy, Indian Buddhist philosophy, and Tibetan philosophy as well. And then secondly, our own inner awareness reveals that phenomenality is an intrinsic property. That is to treat our inner experience as if it were just a matter of these special intrinsic non-relational qualities which divests our experience of its embeddedness, its situatedness, and its embodiment, its relationality, in other words. So I don't find this argument persuasive. Indeed, I find it subject to two different extremes, you could say. One is what would be the, what in philosophy of science today is called the structural realist position, though I would call it the structural reificationist position, which says that, well, actually, um, only relational properties are mind independently real. And they're real structural features of the world apart from the mind, and that's what science is about. So that is, to me, to reify scientific models 
It's to forget that they are idealized abstractions out of our concrete lived experience. But panpsychists fall prey to a different kind of reification because they reify consciousness as an intrinsic property. And they forget its relational and contextual constitution by way of embodiment. Panpsychism also has another interesting problem which is called the combination problem. And this is, a more, in a way, a more interesting one because it leads me, it's going to lead me positively into saying some things about embodiment. So if you think, as a panpsychist does, that there are micro-level phenomenal properties or experiences everywhere, then there's the problem of how do they combine to form macro-level ones. This is a sort of strange mental version of a physicalist composition problem, now just transposed into the mental register. William James put this very well in his writings when he was talking about panpsychism. He says, take a sentence of a dozen words and take 12 men and tell to each one word. Then stand the men in a row or jam them in a bunch and let each think of his word as intently as he will. Nowhere will there be a consciousness of the whole sentence. Where the elemental units are supposed to be feelings, the case is in no wise altered. Take a hundred of them, shuffle them, and pack them as close together as you can. Still, each remains the same feeling it always was. So he's basically saying, look, if you think that there are phenomenal properties scattered everywhere, you need to explain how they cohere in, or combine into subjects of experience. And you don't get that just by sort of putting them in a row. Now, the panpsychist response to this today is to say that, well, mental properties belong only to genuine individuals, not to mere aggregates, not to mere collections, not to conglomerates. But then, how do we determine what counts as a genuine individual? This is the boundary problem. Do elementary particles count as individuals? Well, it doesn't seem like they would count as an individual in the way that, say, a bacterial cell would. So what's the principle of individuation here, exactly? I think one of the best statements of this is um, by Greg Rosenberg, who's, to my mind, one of the most interesting panpsychist philosophers. And he says, the hard nut of the boundary problem is that animal experiencers possess a kind of inherent individuality at a physical mid-level of reality, which is hard to explain. If panpsychism, panpsychism is true, why do the boundaries exist just so? Boundaries are harder to explain than combination. We are faced with the need to understand what it is to be an inherent individual in the natural world. This takes us to embodiment, because the boundary problem is, in a way, the problem of embodiment. Because to be a genuine individual is not simply to be a particular. It's to be a system that has some kind of bounded organizational unity through ongoing internal material transformation. Again, think of a living cell. So that kind of system is not any kind of particular. It's, it's a body. It has an embodiment. OK, so this brings me now to the primacy of embodiment. So let's recall our guiding thoughts, the primacy of consciousness, no way to step outside of lived experience. But now we're looking at the other side of the coin, that lived experience never shows up apart from our embodied being in the world. And in the Merleau-Ponty quotation I gave you earlier, we're now emphasizing this thought. The world is inseparable from the subject, but from a subject who is nothing but a project of the world. Now, to illustrate in the most general way the emergence of individuality, I want to do it in a, in a schematic way by way of this figure. So the circles represent processes under some conditions of observation. And the arrows represent enabling relations or relations of conditioning. So if a circle has an arrow pointing to another circle, then that circle is enabling, is a process that's enabling the one that it's pointing to, contributing to it. Under observation, we see that some of the arrows form a tightly interdependent network, the ones that are black. They have a, a unitary character to them because they have, in the logical or algebraic sense, a kind of closure. That is, every process in that network is the result of another process and is affecting another process. 
It doesn't, closure here doesn't mean that it's separated from the environment because indeed it's, being, it's embedded in the environment in terms of the gray circles and the green arrows which indicate conditioning relations from the network into the environment. But when we have a system that has this kind of network density, we have the emergence of a kind of individuality where every process is contributing to every other process so that the network emerges under certain conditions as having a robust individuality that continues for a time until it dissipates for whatever reason. And each circle, black circle in the network, is doing what it does under conditions of precariousness. Precariousness, yes, that's a word. That is to say, if, if it weren't for that network, the network is functioning as a kind of constraint on it. If it weren't for that network, it would have a tendency to run down and atrophy. So it's holding together because of this entangled mutual modification. Now, I put this in very abstract terms, but you could think of this as, this is, I think, maybe the easiest way to think of it, as the emergence of life, of a protocell, or of a cell with an internal metabolic reaction network that's constantly modifying its activity. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elaborate that in a minute. But before I do that, I want to link this to a very important Buddhist philosophical way of elaborating this concept of dependent origination that we began with earlier. So in Madhyamaka philosophy, particularly as it develops later in India, the, the writings of the commentator on Nagarjuna by Chandrakirti, the idea is that dependent origination can be thought of in three ways or having three aspects. There's causal dependence, dependence on conditions. There's the dependence of the parts on the whole, and we could also say the whole on the parts because um, the, the parts give rise to the whole, but the parts are what they are in context of the whole. And then there's an interesting one that Chandrakirti points out, which is dependence on concepts. That is, we've framed this in a certain way. We're observing it at a certain scale of observation. We're picking out certain things as salient for our purposes. When we do it that way, it then becomes an objective matter, a testable, consensual matter, how, what the nature of the situation is. But it's still being conceptually framed by us. So there's a kind of conceptual dependence here as well. So this is what dependent origination means as it gets elaborated in Indian philosophy. It's a very powerful notion. OK, so let's illustrate this more concretely now in the case of life. The Chilean biologist Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela introduced this idea of autopoiesis, self-production. And what they meant by that is that a system in the molecular domain that's made up of molecular processes that form a reaction network, that is, that catalyze each other's production, produce each other in a way that also involves the fabrication or production of a, of a membrane that makes the system bounded in space, that this is the minimal example of the emergence of, we could say, a body, that is, an individual that's not only individuated but self-individuating because a system like this alters its boundary conditions in a way that, say, a candle flame doesn't, doesn't alter its boundary conditions in the way that a living cell does. So they talked about this as a kind of basic biologic. You have this autopoetic loop. It's a strange loop in a way, you could say, using Hofstetter's term, that complex autopoetic systems are adaptively related to the environment. That is, they can modify their behavior in relationship to their zone of viability, what is, um, what is going to lead to the system's uh, dissolution versus what is going to enable it to um, continue to hold together. This is constantly driving it in relationship to the environment so that we know, for example, that very, very simple bacterial critters that they swim about with the um, Flagella rotating clockwise, counterclockwise, tumbling versus directed swimming, and that this is under the control is too strong a word, is under the modulation of the ongoing autopoetic metabolism. And this is a kind of basic sense making because the, these organisms differentiate in their environment things that are significant versus insignificant sucrose versus heavy metals, things that will make it swim up gradient, that enhance its metabolic continuation, things that will repel it and make it swim away. So I like to put this 
by saying that living, even at this very fundamental level, is sense-making in precarious conditions. That's what it's embodied sense-making in precarious conditions. Now, if we think of this in a, in a much more um, evolutionary sense, where we're particularly focused on animal life, animal life is about multicellularity, about a body that has many kinds of cells with neurons that are needed to signal rapidly and across large distances, sensor, sensory and motor ends. But it's the same kind of strange loop organization where now the autoregulation is facilitated through the self-production of the neuronal cells in a dense network, like those circles with the black arrows that I showed you before. And in animal life, we see what looks more familiar to us, what we would call cognition, emotion, affect, and so on. And of course, in mammal life, this is social from the ground up. There's, in, in mammalian life, no brain is an island. Everything is about coupling and um, co-regulation. So this is very, very quick, going through a number of different things. But what I'm trying to bring out and emphasize to you is what happens when we put life back into consciousness by way of the primacy of embodiment. This perspective transforms how we think about what philosophers call the explanatory gap between consciousness and nature. The gap is no longer, or the problem is no longer the gap between the mental, defined as fundamentally non-physical, or the physical and the physical, defined as fundamentally non-mental, which is how philosophers usually set it up. The problem is rather the passage from the living body to the lived body and back again. How do we negotiate that passage? And that's what I call in my book, Mind and Life, the body-body problem. Negotiating it requires that phenomenology and science work together without one aiming to usurp the other. We can think of this as a kind of mutual circulation or mutual illumination, where phenomenology and science work together to illuminate each other by way of the primacy of consciousness and the primacy of embodiment. OK, so this brings me to the last part of the talk, which is the idea of neurophenomenology, which comes from Francisco Varela. This is, he didn't invent the term, but he, he brought it into current currency and, and used it in a particular way. And in his usage, it works under the assumption of the primacy of consciousness and the primacy of embodiment and investigates the relationship between conscious experience and brain activity. Varela's working idea, this is now back in the, in the 90s, up to the time that he died in 2001, was that the flow of experience, or what William James would call the stream of consciousness, reflects what neuroscientists today call intrinsic brain activity or spontaneous brain activity as much as or more than stimulus evoked activity. So the brain is constantly endogenously generating its own activity and, and it's doing that in a way that's um, under the influence of stimuli. But the way that stimuli are received and dealt with has to do with what the brain is doing intrinsically, spontaneously. And Varela's idea was that a careful phenomenology of the flow of experience can be used to illuminate intrinsic brain activity. It can help to, as it were, recover noise, what would otherwise be treated as noise. And that this kind of phenomenology would benefit from trained contemplative insight. So you can think about it as, on the one hand, we have the phenomenology of consciousness. Now we're really talking about, of course, human consciousness and the neuroscience investigation of it and bringing the neuroscience of meditation into the sphere of the neuroscience of consciousness and bringing meditative insight into the sphere of the phenomenology of consciousness in this mutually illuminating, mutually, mutual circulation way. Now, um, there are a number of, of studies that I just want to um, highlight for you. I'm not going to go through them in detail because we don't have time, that pursued this approach, or at least tried to pilot it to some extent. One was a study that Varela published, or actually appeared after his death, where they looked at different qualities of attention antecedent to the presentation of a stimulus, which was um, a stereogram, a, a depth illusion. And they looked at how the antecedent spontaneous activity and different qualities of attention, distraction versus attentional stability, modulated the behavioral response to the stimuli, 
and the, um, the, the vividness of the, of the perception. And they uh, were investigating this looking at um, frequency, uh, phase, phase synchrony patterns recorded through EEG. So oscillatory activity as recorded by EEG and the, and the temporal phase relationship between the, between the signals. So this was, this was published some years ago. Um, another study that just, uh, just appeared um, a year ago is one that I participated in, which used experienced Theravada Vipassana meditators to report on when they first noticed the arising of a thought. And the idea was to use this ability to, um, to track the neural activity further back in time than would be possible with an untrained observer of the arising of spontaneous thoughts as a way of getting a more fine-grained temporal portrait using fMRI of the antecedent neural activity um, generating spontaneous cognition. And another study looked at um, using real-time fMRI feedback and how people with attentional stability through meditation are able to, um, through the feedback about their own neural activity, to, uh, to modulate in a reliable way their, um, the signals coming from, in this case, it was the, the posterior cingulate as, as measured using fMRI. So these are just all examples of some neurophenomenological kinds of studies. And if you're interested in the details of this, there's a short review paper that um, I did with um, Sina Fazalpur, who's a PhD student of mine, on um, the brain dynamics um, and, and how they're viewed from a neurophenomenological perspective. OK, so neurophenomenology then is about, we could say, cultivating the experiential side of the embodied mind through contemplative training. And Varela's idea was to embed contemplative practice and mind science in a larger common framework based on the primacy of lived experience, where, again, there's a mutual illumination and circulation back and forth between phenomenology and, in this case, neuroscience. All right, so this brings me then to the concluding thoughts. To repeat something that I began with, there's no way to step outside of consciousness as lived experience and to measure it against something else. Everything we investigate is disclosed from within lived experience. And direct experience never shows up apart from our being embodied and situated in the world. It therefore makes no sense to aim to reduce experience to something essentially non-experiential, as the physical is classically conceived to be. Rather, understanding how consciousness is a natural phenomenon may require radical revision to our scientific concept of nature, such that consciousness, in quotation marks because I'm talking about the concepts now, such that consciousness and nature don't mutually exclude each other at the outset or by construction, as they have basically for us since Descartes. Rather, they imply each other or arise from something neutral between them. At the same time, our ultimate and truly hard problem, our hardest task, is not to solve an abstract mind-body problem. It's rather to live the mutual dependence of experience and embodiment with benevolence, with mindfulness, and with care. And this is especially meant to, if you were at Adam's talk yesterday, to echo his discussion of the situation we find ourselves in today on the planet, the, the Anthropocene and whether that's going to be a good or a bad Anthropocene. So I want to end with Stephen Batchelor's poetic rendering of one of the verses from Nagarjuna's Fundamental Stanzas of the Middle Way. This is one of my, my favorite, um, favorite ways of, of rendering some of his thoughts. You are not the same as or different from conditions on which you depend. You are neither severed from nor forever fused with them. This is the deathless teaching of Buddhas who care for the world. And then my favorite part, when Buddhas don't appear and their followers are gone, the wisdom of awakening bursts forth by itself. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Well, um... Now I'll open to questions from the audience. I just ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to bring the microphone to you because we have video recording this. 
Okay. Hi. Um, so I have a question. So one of the things that I um, is find, find most interesting about the idea of consciousness is all these um, ongoing works on machine learning, right? So a lot mm -hmm. of these things now cars can drive. You know, they can respond to you when you speak to your phone. So how do you actually start to draw the line as to where is this just a machine doing some sort of, you know, linear fitting, or where is it actually conscious? When is it actually making decisions? And how does that really fit into the, the large, you know, big data era that we live in? How do you start to draw out the same notions of consciousness and neuropsychology that you're talking about here into a more technological space? Yeah. Um. So I, I think of all of those technological devices and advances, especially you know, coming out of computational work, as examples of the re-implementation via technology of the abstraction from concrete lived experience, so that the concrete lived experience is then altered by the, the technological re-implementation of those um, scientific idealizations, abstractions, mathematical models, and so on. With regard to consciousness, my own view, I didn't, you know, I didn't argue for this today, but this would be my view, is that, um, or let me put it this way, that, that embodiment, lived experience in the sense of embodied situated experience requires a system that is going to have the kind of individuation or autonomy, we could say, that we see in life, in living systems. And that we have not been able to achieve this in robotics. Um, it's proved to be an extremely difficult problem. And that it may indeed someday happen that we have systems of that sort. But simply building devices that are able to control their own operation in certain ways is not sufficient to create a system that is autonomous in that sense that it individuates itself in relationship to its environment and constantly things in the world matter for it by because of that ongoing demand of individuation where you know metabolism is the concrete example of that in terms of life so i you know i think we're far away from that um, and i think that you know that, that that's actually really necessary for consciousness in, in the way that, um, that I think of consciousness. Yeah. This is not something that you know, most people who work in AI would agree with. Um, it's, it's very much, there, there's a sort of line of work in AI that emphasizes the importance of autonomous agency and the difficulty of building truly autonomous agents. But autonomy means here what we see clearly in the case of a living organism. The kind of autonomy that a living organism has is not the kind of autonomy that we see in any artificial system yet. We may someday, though. I think the thing that um, excites me most about what has been said here, both by Peter C. and by Evan is the, um, the idea of a new kind of science, of like something that is, I don't know what it is, you know? It's, it's something new. It incorporates, obviously, first-person subjectivity. And one of the things that I feel like has been maybe l left out a little bit or I haven't heard mentioned, the primacy of embodiment, you know? This is, this is the body. And consciousness, awareness, interacting with the body, being placed in different areas of the body, the body itself adopting different positions, different movements, different experiences arising through the body. I'm particularly talking about Qigong, but of course there are many other systems that do the same kind of thing with an incredible amount of detail and power in terms of exploring the nature of consciousness and the nature of embodiment. And I would see that, you know, 
very much as one of the uh, seasonings in the stew, or maybe one of the you know vegetables or the the meat and potatoes in that stew. Yeah, uh, I mean, I completely agree with that. I'm a I'm a long term Taiji Chuan practitioner, so I'm committed to the importance of the embodied perspective in terms of body practices and what they can tell us about affect and emotion and attention and intention and awareness. And there's, there's some work in a neurophenomenological vein that's being done with some of these kinds of somatic practices. Not a lot, um, but it's a very interesting and, and you know, fertile area. My, um, my wife, Rebecca Todd, is a neuroscientist, but before she became a neuroscientist and came over to the dark side, as I like to say, she was a contemporary dance choreographer. So, um, and we have another person here who works in dance and neuroscience. So I, I think that's an extremely interesting and, and very fertile area to explore, yeah. Thanks a lot for your talk. I, um, I, I was uh, thinking about this uh, model of the horizon and I wondered um, if the question that's sort of coming to my mind is, whether saying that all consciousness is horizon is the same thing as saying that consciousness is not all inclusive or that it's limited. Mm -hmm. And if, if, it, if it's not, if it means something more than that, what more does it mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, one of the things I like about the horizon metaphor is that um, it, it's a structure that goes with you, but of course, you move and explore and you open up new horizons. So, you know, the way that Husserl, for example, thinks of it is that when we, we, we explore what he calls the outer and inner horizon of things, we explore um, how things look from different perspectives, how they're situated, you know, as figure to ground, how my view of it from here um, refers to a possible view that I could have of it from there and my perception is always a kind of sensory motor exploration. So we're constantly um, you know, structured by a horizon, but we're also changing the horizon and opening it up to um, new vistas. And then Husserl has this wonder, wonderful sort of way of saying that the world is the horizon of all horizons. And what he means by that is that it's, it's not just another horizon, it's the, um, the, 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 the thought that we, can th that, that we can think that all horizons themselves open up into other ones and that at the limit, the horizon of all of that is really what we, what we think when we think the concept world. And he, in this context, has this marvelous statement where he says, um, the world is one, but not in a sense in which it could have been two. So the horizon is the horizon of all horizons is one all-encompassing horizon, but not in a sense in which it could have been you know, two rather than one. So I think of the horizon as, a, as an open concept in that way. It's not a limitation. I mean, of course, it is a limitation in one sense, but it's a limitation that always points beyond itself. And, and this is the idea in phenomenology, really, of transcendence, that consciousness is that which always, in some sense, opens up to what's beyond itself. Let me just make a comment connecting Go ahead, yeah. <clears throat> to your image of the circle. Um, I call it the island of knowledge. So there is some similarity mm. there. And as a good island of knowledge, you know, it's surrounded by the ocean of the unknown, the mystery, right? And perhaps that's the horizon, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's this need that we have to go beyond the known into the unknown, right? And that's where perhaps this yeah. human curiosity and transcendence is, is all rooted at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this reminds me of, um, you know, way back in college studying philosophy and comparative religion, one term that stuck with me, and I don't remember from where it came, but transcendental subjectivity. Mm -hmm. Just so it encompasses both, all. Yeah, transcendental subjectivity is, is, is Husserl's way of talking about the primacy of lived experience. Okay. Yeah, it's, <laughs> Thank that, you. it's that it's not, it's transcendental because it's the condition of possibility for anything showing up in the way that it does for us, um, which means that it's not 
as a condition of possibility, it's not just another thing in the world. It's, um, it's transcendental. And he talks about this in terms of subjectivity. And then he shifts eventually into talking about um, the life world. Um, and some of us would see this as his kind of grappling with his still being caught in Cartesian ways of thinking that are bound to a notion of subjectivity, whereas he's shifting into trying to talk about the primacy of the, of the life world towards his later thought. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. I just wanted to, uh, to ask you what you thought about the fact that this term consciousness, I, I think part of the reason it's problematic is that it's, it's, it implies a thingness. Mm -hmm. um, so that whether we think of it as being either innate or emergent, there's always this mistake that, it, that it's somehow something that is there, a property that things have rather than this participatory yeah. uh, field. Um, and I wonder what you think about the possibilities for turning to, to, to words more like attention or awareness, because there's at least overlap there with fields like neuroscience, although then there is the problem of whether it's something that, that uh, is uh, implicit or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, there's always a problem with nest words that they can get reified. They're, you know, um, they're prone to that. Um, I tend to try to vary the words that I use. So sometimes I use consciousness, sometimes I talk about awareness. Um, I don't think attention is synonymous with either consciousness or awareness. Um, attention for me is a, is a cognitive function that has to do with, um, with selection. And it's, it's, it's used in a lot of different ways depending on the, the cognitive science context itself, I suppose. Um, so, I, I do use attention when I'm really wanting to refer to a specific way in which cognition or awareness is modified or modulated so that something is being oriented towards and selected. That's usually the way the cognitive psychologists talk about it, I suppose. Um, so you know, sometimes I talk about lived experience, or sometimes I talk about embodied experience, or sometimes I talk about um, awareness versus the contents of awareness. And you know, at the end of the day, they're all words, and it sort of depends who you're talking to and what the conversation is. But I do agree that you know we need to be cautious with the words and be sensitive to the ways that they can you know distort what we're trying to talk about. Yeah. Um, but it might be that attention and consciousness are as close together as can be, uh, without being the same, like a married relationship. Yeah. Where. Um, that which we call consciousness is the domain of everything that we can volitionally attend or are volitionally attending now. And so I would challenge people, you know, can you, th can you find something uh, that you are, um, that you can be conscious of that you cannot volitionally attend at your will or anything that you're volitionally attending now that you're not conscious of? So if that's true, it's like the relationship of an operator to the operands. Yeah. Or, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so this is a debate, I would say, in cognitive neuroscience right now between people who think that there's a kind of phenomenal consciousness or phenomenal awareness that um, is awareness or, or experience apart from any possibility of attentional access to it, and those who, tr who say that that's not really a coherent notion and that if it's, if it's a conscious, I mean, of course, you know all this, right? If it's a conscious experience, then there has to be the possibility of attentional access to it. Um, so, I mean, I'm, in, I'm inclined to think, to agree with you, that when we're talking about awareness, there's, um, there's got to be the possibility of some kind of attention where that means some possibility of, of orienting towards it and enhancing certain aspects of it for certain aims, volitional or intentional. That's, that's how I would be inclined to think of it, for sure, yeah. But it, but it just to be, you know, I guess open-minded, it's, it's contested, right? Um, certainly within the context of Buddhist, say, Abhidharma philosophy, um, a, you know, attention, well, or the word that we translate as attention, um, which for them has, in that, in that 
context the sense of orienting towards something before it's even sort of selected for like scrutiny, um, that that's what's called a, a constantly present mental factor. So any moment of awareness has that factor. And an, a moment of awareness is like a hand, and there are the various fingers that are always there that enable you to kind of cognitively grasp something. So attention is like one of those fingers that enables you to sort of grasp something. But, they, but attention, we wouldn't still reduce awareness to attention. Attention would be a kind of uh, aspect or component or factor of awareness, yeah. The, um, that, that, particular, that particular question um, makes me feel like um, it, maybe it needs empirical rather than abstract investigation. Now, that may not be true of that specific question, but more generally, if we're dealing with neurophenomenology, the, sure. the th thing I love about, about phenomenology as opposed to most forms of philosophy is that it includes an, an empirical practice of, of actual direct investigation, which you know, I think is essential to this whole uh, endeavor. And you know, I've, um, I've practiced various forms of meditation, which are definitely that, and I've read a certain amount about the methods in phenomenology, and I'm continually frustrated at not being able to find any source of clear descriptions or you know, training how to cultivate the specific methods of phenomenology. And so partly I'm asking you for references. And yeah. That, but it's, it's um, just <laughs> I mean, so this is the situation in sort of the canonical phenomenological texts, you know, text by Husserl, text by Sartre or Merleau-Ponty, is that you have these um, very rich descriptions. Um, and there's no real discussion of, you know, how these descriptions came to be in terms of the you know, the volition and the attention of the phenomenologist. Um, you know, there's scattered things in Husserl, and, and Husserl is a kind of interesting case because his descriptions always, in a way, outstrip his theoretical structure. So, you know, he's, he's trying to do things theoretically, and, the, and they draw him into, you know, real concrete phenomena of, you know, of, of uh, importance and interest, like our consciousness of time. And then he starts to investigate it and describe it. And the descriptions actually outrun his theoretical constructions. Then he has to go back and rework the theory. And this, like his whole life is about this, which, I mean, is very fertile. That's not a criticism. But by the same token, there's very little you can find um, about what exactly is the attentional skill that's required to generate these kinds of descriptions. And of course, in um, contemplative traditions, there's, there's obviously much more of that. Um, um, there are practice communities and traditions and, and instructions on, on, on you know, how to do, do those kinds of things. Yeah. So this is why the movement in phenomenology today is to, is to try to be enriched by those, the, by those practices. OK, you have one more question. I think there's one back there, and oh, Adam also had one, too. OK, two more questions. Three more questions. Okay. <laughs> so let's make it brief. Very briefly. Um, I'm not sure I understand at all the idea of lived experience. I'm sitting here thinking, does your idea of consciousness and so forth and lived experience exclude sudden blinding insights from some sort of beyond? Something beyond I've ever lived in my experience. Um, no, it doesn't exclude that. Um, I think there are countless reports throughout many traditions of people who report sudden insights that they experience as beyond. What beyond exactly means, that's a whole other question. But experientially, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, dismiss that at all. Yeah. Uh, your discussion about the attention uh, made me think a little bit about the unconscious. Um, is, there, is that the main difference between consciousness and unconsciousness, just attention? Or are there other aspects of unconsciousness that can be uh, applied with its neurophenomenologic point of view to try to figure out what's going on? Um, well, the idea of neurophenomenology is that increased stability of attention can facilitate access to aspects of, um, let's say, cognition that would not otherwise be readily accessible. So it's, it, it can maybe change the threshold of 
unconscious versus conscious. But of course, from the perspective of embodiment, you know, most of what we are is not accessible to our, you know, our cognition, our consciousness, nor should it be. It wouldn't be a good thing if it were, probably. <laughs>